everyone, and welcome to another episode. Today, we are going to be talking about The Healthy Vegetable Garden, which is the name of a new book by freelance writer Sally Morgan, who is also the editor of the Soil Association's Organic Farming Magazine. Welcome to the show today, Sally. That's lovely to be joining you today um, from the other side of the pond. Yes, I'm excited. And I should say the subtitle of your book also. The subtitle is A Natural Chemical-Free Approach to Soil Biodiversity and Managing Pests and Diseases, which I think does a really good job of explaining what you mean when you named the book The Healthy Vegetable Garden. But just in case anybody's still not clear, tell us exactly what the title of the book means. Um, well, yes, for, for me, um, I started writing a book on controlling pests and diseases uh, organically. Uh, and I suddenly realized that it wasn't just that, it was a far more holistic approach to things. So the book got much larger and I started looking at soil health uh, and how everything to do with biodiversity in the garden was so critical. So the, the subtitle of the book evolved because it's organic. And I like to explain to people that organic is uh, pesticides and chemi uh, chemicals that we don't use. Um, but it's more than that. It's the soil health, which leads to healthy plants, which leads to healthy people. It's very much um, the organic mantra uh, of getting that right. And so that's where the sort of book is coming from, looking at um, establishing this lovely, healthy ecosystem in your growing space that is going to produce for you lovely, healthy vegetables. Okay. And one of the things I thought was really fun when I was reading the introduction is that you had some quotes there from famous farmers from many years ago, like Thomas Jefferson and um, Sir Albert Howard. Because a lot of people, I think, have this idea that organic is like this new trend or new fad that, you know, oh, it's not going to last. But, and I'm always reminding people that all agriculture was organic prior to World War II. And so I just love the quotes that you have in there from some of these older farmers who knew things like there's a really wonderful letter from Thomas Jefferson talking about how they're going to pile manure in the garden this fall so that they'll have better crops next year. Yeah, and um, working for the Soil Association, is we're looking back at some of our pioneers that, you know, are 70, 80 years ago now. Uh, and as you're quite right, it's everything pre-war is how we always did things. Um, and some of the stuff that Albert Howard was working on in India were absolutely innovative. He was really ahead of his time. And, and when I look through some of the books that you can read online now, I mean, he was an amazing guy using, again, manure and getting his composting systems going. And, and the Jefferson quotes in there because, oh, 20 years ago, I was out in Virginia visiting gardens. And I felt it was a very English gardens that I was looking at. Uh, and we went around Monticello and we learned about the story there. And I've always been impressed with those beautiful vistas from the, the vegetable gardens there and everything was looking fabulous. And um, so, yeah, looking back, organic is a natural way of doing things. And and I think currently there's a little bit of confusion because people are thinking about regenerative agriculture, which is, I don't know what it's like in the States, but over here it's the big thing and agroecology. And everybody's arguing over these terms, but actually organic tops all of those. Organic's been around all the time. It's the natural way of doing things and it encompasses regenerative and it encompasses agroecological ways. Um, so yeah, for me, like you, organic is, is the way, it's the only way really. And as we see the demise of the insects at the moment, and there's amazing books around telling us about insect life on the plummeting, uh, it's so important that us as gardeners actually help um, our insect populations in our own growing spaces. One of the things that I think is great about your book is that the first chapter is about building our soil, which if somebody is new to the idea of organic agriculture or organic gardening, they're going to be like, what do you mean building our soil? Like dirt is dirt. It's just there. How do you build soil? Um, so can you explain that idea? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you mentioned the word dirt. And I was um, in an interesting um, seminar with um, Elaine Ingham, um, soil lady from um, 
the States, who basically explained that soil was full of life and organic matter um, and dirt was just literally stuff that didn't have any life in her mind. Um, and so, yeah, for me, soil is lots of organic matter because that's going to take up carbon and help in our climate change battle. Um, and actually the most important thing to me is the soil life, all those microbes that we can't see, plus all the worms and the beetles and everything else. So soil is the key, get that right um, and you'll have healthy plants. Uh, and one of the other things that I keep on going on about for people who use chemicals is that if you're using fertilizer in your garden for a quick return, you're not benefiting your garden. Um, the fertilizer is what I describe as fast food, ready-made food for those plants just to grab and grow. And it's bypassing all the amazing artisan microbes, which are doing all those clever things of converting organic matter to food that the plants can use. And as a consequence, you're gonna lose your biodiversity in the soil and you'll always need fertilizers because you haven't got any microbes left. Uh, and it's the same with glyphosate. You start using that and you kill off, you start using pesticides and you kill your fungi. So yeah, um, getting your soil health right is, is the starting point. Yeah, I think it's fascinating how we lose soil we lose topsoil in the united states um i don't remember the statistics but i know when i first heard that i thought it meant because we didn't keep things planted 12 months a year and the wind was blowing the soil away but then i had a potted plant and i noticed that the level of the soil in the potted plant was going down and then it clicked <laughs> like it's not just the wind is blowing dust away because there's nothing planted there half the year. There's more to it than that. Yeah, I, and I've seen those photos too. I mean, um, up in east of England, we have an area called Fenland, which has been drained. And there's some horrifying posts that show you that you're 30 meters below the level of the ground in the 17th century, um, which is frightening in its own right. Um, just blowing away and I've seen it physically myself you know clouds of soil just disappearing off um, but you're right um, my pots are always being topped up because that organic matter is broken down and it's being used by the plants um, so it is a continual cycle recycling process uh, and as gardeners I hope that we can latch into that uh, and see that it's a a closed loop system in our gardens that we are putting back into the soil, what we're taking out. So you've got all this wonderful information in there about building your soil and everything. Cause of course, healthy plants are better able to resist pests and disease. Um, but even with the best soil, sometimes you might have some problems with pests and disease. And um, you also talk about natural predators. I know a lot of people like their first instinct is just like, they see a bug, they think let's kill it. <laughs> Um, and another guest that I, I had interviewed already was saying that, you know, almost all the insects you can see in your garden are not actually pests. They're, they're beneficial. Um, what are some of the tips that you would have for people who are getting started and having trouble with this concept that most insects are our friends? Yeah, and absolutely. And it's a natural reaction, isn't it? You've, you've taken so much time to plant all these seedlings and things, and then something comes along and starts nibbling them. I think for me, and, and particularly when it's a new garden and you haven't got the balance going and you haven't got your predators going, I think the key thing for me is don't panic. And a classic example was me, and I, I go onto Instagram and Twitter and everybody is complaining that the aphids are on their, um, their broad bean this spring. We had a a very wet, cold spring and then a warm period. And all of a sudden, all the black fly went bang, you know, and everybody was panicking and they were getting out their sprays and you sort of think, no, just sit back. So my first advice is watch, look, learn. And for me, I did have black fly on my broad beans this, this spring and I waited a week and they were all gone the week later because um, I think some birds had come down and, and found them. And um, and also the ladybugs hadn't got going because the spring was late. And then uh, they came along and control was gained. So I think sit back, look, learn, don't panic, don't pull them up. I mean, at the moment, another example, uh, lots of people are growing tomatoes and it's that time of year for tomato blight. Um, and everybody's panicking because they've seen tomato blight on their 
plants and they're going to rip them up and remove them to save the rest. Uh, and actually just remove a few leaves, get the plants well watered, look after them and, and they'll probably recover. So it's the panic thing, you know, relax, enjoy it and, and learn a little bit more uh, and watch. Okay. That's interesting. When I live in Illinois, which we normally have very hot summers and I never had trouble with tomato blight until one summer, which I originally thought was the most wonderful summer ever because the temperature is probably very much like England. They were in the seventies all summer. And, um, Oh, I don't know how that translates to Celsius for you. Um, but it was super nice. It was not this super hot, you know, summers that we were used to. And then I very quickly learned like, oh, this is the perfect condition (laughs) for blight because that is exactly what happened was all of my tomato plants started having problems with blight. Uh, And blight's a nasty one. It creeps up on you um, over here. The the varieties of blight that we suffer from like it warm and wet, perfect conditions. Uh, And you've just got to be observant again and whip out the, take those leaves off as soon as you see them. And also to be quite careful around the plants. I see people wandering around their potato plots and then they go and have a look at their tomatoes and they're probably carrying the spores from one crop to another. So some of the things I am quite careful with is cleaning my shoes before I go in my greenhouses so that I don't carry the spores in with me. Um, But it is again, observant, be observant uh, and remove the leaves and, and just let the plant get on with it, give them a good feed um and let them recover hopefully so you have a whole chapter on boosting defenses which is really interesting and you have lots of different things you mentioned about biocontrols and lures traps sprays are there any of those that would be good for people to put in place before they see a problem just to be proactive Yes, I suffer a lot from uh, the white butterflies, and I think you do too, um, with the cabbage white butterflies on our brassicas. And I, every year I get them. Um, there's, there's loads of them outside at the moment. And so I do put a mesh over my brassica beds um, to protect them. Uh, we get a cabbage root fly, and again, I will put barriers up beforehand to intercept the problem. Uh, and I think critically, Sometimes the most vulnerable stage of a plant's life is those first stages when its roots are quite small and it hasn't got much leaf area. And if you can cover them up at that point and get them quickly through the most vulnerable stage, then they've got a chance to come on. So yeah, I think meshes uh, and other barriers are are great. Um, You can use traps for moths and things so you intercept the problem. You could put grease bands on your fruit trees to, to stop the beasties uh, climbing up the trees um, and overwintering in your trees. So there's lots of easy barrier things you can do. Uh, and also if you're a novice um, gardener, I'd get some plants in early. So things which are gonna help companion planting. So I have loads of marigolds in the garden. That's the French type, the popped marigolds as well. I have lots of nasturtiums growing absolutely everywhere in the hopes that they will attract the pests away from your crops. So lots of plants, lots of flowers uh, and some covers to give them a little bit of control. Okay. Yeah. That's funny. Cause I used to never think about putting flowers in my vegetable garden. I just kind of thought like, okay, this is for the vegetables. And, um, and I realized that when I did put some flowers in there, that it also really increased the pollinators that I saw, like, I thought, oh, I don't need this because I have bees. And I don't even remember what possessed me to finally start planting some flowers in there. But I was really surprised at how many benefits there were to having flowers in the garden. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the vegetable beds to be just as colorful uh, as the flower beds in that respect. I mean, I've got loads of flowers and I throw all sorts of things in. Uh, not just so I can cut them for the bars, which is lovely too. Um, but you're right, you want the pollinators and the predators to come in and they've got slightly different requirements. Um, when you look at insects, they've got slightly different lengths of mouse part. Um, some have got longer ones and they can go into the tubular flowers. Others have got short mouse parts and they need a more open flower. So the more diversity you have in flowers, again, the more you're gonna bring the insects in. 
and, and give you that control. So yeah, the flowers are just as important, but a pack of seeds is brilliant because that's all you need. Um, you know, you're gonna get hundreds of nasturtiums out of a pack of seed. And once you've got nasturtiums in the garden, you've always got them. They're always gonna set seed. And it's the same with pot marigolds. I let them go everywhere. It's a bit orange out there at the moment, <laughs> but it's, it's full of life. I bet it's beautiful. One of the things that surprised me is I, I've been gardening for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And, um, I kind of thought I had like, at least heard it all at least briefly. But one of the things that surprised me that I had never seen before was the idea of using milk in the garden that was listed in your chapter of defenses. I mean, milk, it's so innocent. It's what you feed babies. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it's great for the mildew. So um, milk is diluted down, just mix it down with a bit of water and, and put it in a spray, hand spray or something. Um, and it's to do with altering the surface of the leaf. So it's less attractive to your mildew. Um, and you just it's one of those defences just to give the plant a chance. Um, I also talk in the book about how important the microbes on the leaf surface are, um, the, the phylosphere. Um, we talk a lot about microbes around the roots, but on the surface of the leaves, in fact, any surface of the plant, you get this amazing um, mix of microbes and um, protozoa and, and all sorts of things. So you've got to be careful when you use all these um, sort of mixes. But if you've got mildew and you've had problems, particularly on your squash, school jets and squash, uh, then get the, the milk spray out early. You, once you see the mildew, you're a bit too late. So it's a pro proactive treatment um, give it a good spray let it drain right off the leaf um, it may not work but it, it it might give you that just that edge that the plant can then withstand the fungal spores so it's, it's a question of putting the plant into the the winning side as it were a better balance for the plant against the the pathogen uh, and give it a try it's not going to cost you anything and i bet you've got some old milk set in the, in the fridge somewhere that you can put to some good use and just see, and you know, it just might swing the balance in the favor of the plant. Yeah. Well, since we have goats here, we usually have plenty of milk. And so we can, it's definitely something that we can try. And we do have trouble with mildew on our squash plants. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't seen it yet. So I'm going to go tell my husband, let's put some milk in a spray bottle with water and go out there and give it a spray. Yeah. Nothing to lose. Right. So on the, the wonderful thing towards the end of your book, you've got this lovely encyclopedia, the, this A to Z of pests and diseases where people can look things up and figure out like exactly what kind of problems um, they have and how to fix them. And um, which I think that's always wonderful for people to have that kind of, of a resource in a book. Um, what are some of your favorite or one of the favorite things to do for plants to help them along? It's a tricky one that because there's all sorts of nasties out there that I'm trying to control and get balanced. But I think um, for me, I like trying to keep the biology in place. So under my covered crops this year, I, I suffer a lot from red spider mite. Uh, and so I've been using biocontrols, which are nematodes. And I think nematodes are one of my favorite um, attack mechanisms in the garden. Um, they are naturally in soil, but these particular ones have been chosen because they will target a particular species of pest. And so in my polytunnel, which is um, a, a very you know, artificial environment, like a greenhouse, um, very artificial, very hot, humid at this time of year, um, I do get red spider mites and I can see them having a go at my, my squash, my cucumbers um, and my aubergines. And so I've been using biocontrols, which will um, basically be sprayed onto the little tipped onto the leaf and, and the little tiny um, nematodes or the, uh, in the case of the red, red spider mite, it's a little parasitic wasp and the like. Those types of things are really useful. So red spider mite um, and slugs and snails for my nematodes as well. Um, nematodes in the soil will go for slugs and snails um, and they enter the slug or the snail's body and they release bacteria which kill the slug. So using these biocontrols, if you choose the right agent 
The other one is for white fly using Encarsia parasitic wasp. Um, all of these are very neat because they don't interfere with the biology um, of the area. Uh, they're natural um, and gonna do their job in a natural way rather than spraying something which might attack a, a non-target uh, species. So I'm really careful about sprays and things, even if they are organic, because you've got to be careful that you don't damage your ladybugs and the larvae um, at the same time. So um, trying to target the species and go for biocontrols um, is one of my, my favorite. And I like the biology, of course, behind it. Very clever. <laughs> yeah, that's a great suggestion. And it's that's actually not something that I've done much with. Um, we definitely do it out in the barn for five or six years now. We've been getting these little, um, they're called fly predators or fly eliminators or something. And they're these little tiny parasitic wasps. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever I wonder if they're doing any good, um, something will happen and like somehow we will miss a shipment. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, that was really helping so much. <laughs> or will someone will visit and say, wow, you don't really have any fly problems. Um, because they are, they're extremely helpful, um, in the barn to just keep the fly population down. Totally. And I think if you use some of these controls regularly, uh, you get on top of the populations, um, for slugs and snails, we've had a horrific year because of the wet weather and they're chewing through things still. Um, and if you use a nematode at the beginning of the year, um, and it won't kill everything, it won't take out all of your slugs and snails. Um, to the disappointment of the people who use the controls, but they're keeping the levels down. So it's within manageable levels. And if you do these things regularly, um, you're never going to wipe out all the pressed and you don't want to wipe them all out. As you said earlier, there's, there's a role for them all, but you just want to get control back. And this little regular top up just gives you a chance to have some control with the problem. Are there any common mistakes that you see people making when they're fairly new to the idea of having an organic garden? I think it's the rapidity of the action that they sort of go in and they want to pull something out or they want to use an organic spray and they'd have read about them that they're organic. Um, and then they don't check the plant to see whether there's any beneficials around, um, which is so important because I'm sure you know that, you know, ladybug larvae are quite unusual organisms. And I think as a newbie to, to gardening, you don't recognize the larvae. You know what the adult looks like. You know what the hoverflies look like. You know what the, um, the ladybugs look like, but you don't know what their larval stages look like. And I think some of the newer gardeners don't look carefully enough to see whether they've got some really useful animals in their garden before they pull up something. Um, and, and if you react too quickly, you're not letting your natural um, beneficials have a go at controlling it for you. So it is this sort of, again, don't panic, sit back, look very carefully, see what you've got in your garden before you take some action, uh, because, you know, it will all balance out eventually. That is a really great point. I think you've provided a lot of really useful information. Where can people find you online if they want to connect with you? Uh, I've got a website, so it's uh, sallymorgan.co.uk and I'm on Instagram as well, like everybody. Um, I'm not under my own name under Instagram. It's the underscore organic underscore plot. So the organic plot um, with gaps between it. Um, so yeah, I'd happily converse with people if they've got any problems or they want to dig de deeper into some of the issues I've raised today. Um, and the book, of course, is out next month, so that'll be good too. So, but happy to uh, give advice to people if they want to come find me on social media. Yeah, this will be great. And by the time this airs, the book will be out, so people will be able to get it right away. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's good fun. So I uh, look forward to hearing some of your listeners. <laughs>